Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. It's hard to believe, but the 2022 boa breeding season has reached an end, and it's certainly been an exciting and event-filled season for me. Today, I'm going to review a brief recap of the season, including the highlights, some of the lowlights, as well as some of the things that I've learned and some of the things that I'll do differently in the upcoming 2023 boa breeding season. I'm also going to show off some of the beautiful babies that I was lucky enough to have born here this year, uh, as well as say a little bit about what I'm planning for the pairings for 2023. So be sure to stay tuned for that. It just struck me that I've been calling it the 2022 boa breeding season. I really should call it the boa breeding year because basically all four seasons of the year, something I am doing is devoted to the boas. And there's really no time during the year that doesn't go into my boa breeding. So it's really not a seasonal thing, it's like a year-round thing. So maybe I'll just call it the 2022 boa breeding year. But anyway, I digress. 2022 was a really good year for me overall. Uh, it was a record number in terms of the number of litters that I've had, as well as the number of pairings and the number of babies born. And so I actually set up quite a few more pairings this year than I did in previous years. Uh, overall, I would say my success rate is about the same. There was a lot that didn't work, as well as a lot that did work. But boa breeding is hard. And every year I learn a little bit more. You know, even after all these years, I'm still learning a lot. And every year I realize how much I don't know and how much of it is just out of our control. Uh, so that's one of the things that keeps me going with the boa breeding, the challenges of trying to improve year to year and doing things a little bit differently, tweaking things and hoping that there's gonna be a better result. And this year I certainly picked up some new ideas based on my results from this year that I'll take into the next year's breeding. I think with boa breeding, people have this false sense of how difficult or how easy it is, I should say. And most of what we see about boa breeding from other people comes through social media, of course. You know, of course, you're watching this YouTube video. You probably also look at pictures on Facebook, Instagram, and the other social media platforms. And by and large, most of what people share are the positive things. You know, the babies that are born, the beautiful babies and their goo glistening in the morning sun. People see these pictures of the beautiful babies and get this idea that they can do that. And everybody, of course, wants to believe that things are going to work. This is just how humans are. You know, it's part of our psychology that we have this kind of rosier picture of the future than it typically turns out uh, turning into. And so I think with boa breeding, a lot of the people that stick with it are the ones that kind of got lucky in the beginning. And I think that happened to me. My first few years, I only had a few pairings, but I had some really nice problem-free litters. Everything seemed to work. It was actually surprising, you know, it seemed like it was easier than I had even expected. Of course, a few years later, I had some years that just weren't so good and kind of made me realize, well, this isn't quite as easy as I thought. I think that the people, maybe if people don't have good years at the beginning, they get out and they don't continue. Maybe that's why so many people don't continue breeding boas for the long run. But now I'm kind of reached an appreciation that it's not easy, it can be done. You know, there are ways that you can increase your odds of success. You can't guarantee anything. We can't take things for granted. So we should really just focus on the things that work. And actually I'm holding here, this is a Venezuelan true red tail. My first litter of Venezuelans this year. Really happy with this litter. Turned out really nice. These are from a known locality from the Tamatama village in Southern Venezuela a line founded by Terry Cullen. And I think it's been a while since anyone's produced Venezuelan true red tails. As far as I know, this is the only litter born this year, at least in the United States, uh, maybe in the last few years. I know my buddy Michael Beach had a litter a couple of years ago. If, if you know of any litters of Venezuelans born this year, you know, please let me know. I'd love to hear it in the comments. But just really happy with this litter, you know, producing a type of true red tail that you really don't see that much. And this was actually the second attempt I had tried breeding the same pair the previous year in 2021 wasn't successful, but this year was my year for Venezuelan. So you just have to look at the positives sometimes and try not to uh, focus as much on the negatives. So I, as I mentioned, I did have some litters that didn't go well, ending, ending either in slugs or in stillborns or both. And my intention originally was to share all these things with you almost in real time as they develop. 
kind of like a uh, blog of my boa breeding progress. Uh, what, as it turned out, I didn't really share many of the negatives. And really, there weren't a whole lot of negatives, but you have one bad litter, and it just, it can be devastating. It can be as bad, it can, basically, one bad litter can outweigh all the positives of like 10 good litters. Uh, it just really hurts, it really stings. Um, so I had a litter early on, of actually a Peruvian boas, and it really wasn't a litter because it wasn't successful, but it was uh, consisted of uh, seven stillborn Peruvians and some slugs, and um, everything seemed to be fine up until, you know, I, I discovered this litter. You know, she was looking fine. The gravid female was behaving normally. I don't know why these animals didn't make it. They were perfectly formed. Um, so I had intended originally to share some of these things. When I discovered that litter, I was just kind of emotionally uh, taken, so to speak. I was uh, just kind of started getting choked up. I really couldn't think about making a video. Um, you know, it was disappointment, sadness, a little bit of anger. So in that kind of a state, I just can't put on a camera, film myself and share it with the world. I just have to kind of think about it and kind of process it. So I didn't end up sharing uh, that, that litter or a couple others that happened um, with you guys. I did mention them, I believe, in passing. And so I just wanted to say that I did have uh, these litters that didn't go so well this year. As I mentioned, I do things a little bit differently every year. This year, my main change was that I started my pairings about a month earlier. So typically I pair up in early to mid-December. This year I paired up in early to mid-November. And so I started my cooling cycling a little bit earlier, you know, the end of October, and paired them up. And overall, it seems like maybe this helped. I, you know, I didn't see a huge increase in terms of the success rate. I did see I had quite a few litters that were born earlier. In fact, I had one litter born on March 31st of uh, Pearl Island boas, which my, is my earliest boa litter ever. Um, and then in general, the boas were born a little bit earlier. So I think that helps having the boas born a little earlier so that you have more time to establish them before you hit the uh, end of the shipping season once it gets too cold. So I'm probably gonna do that again, uh, start my pairings in early to mid-November, which is, as you know, just right around the corner. As you may know from some of my other breeding videos, I keep my boas paired for a long time. Typically four to six months they're together or until the females obviously gravid. And so when I started my breeding a little bit earlier in November, it allowed me to keep the animals together a little bit longer until basically around late May, early June, whether the females gravid or not, I just end the pairing at that point, just so that I can get some more weight back on my breeders. And so this year I would say that keeping the animals together for that long, about three quarters of the pairs that I paired up ended up with a gravid female. So that was a little bit higher than my normal rate of success. So I think that extra time does help. However, I did have a higher than normal rate of slugs or uh, litters that were just stillborns and slugs. So it seemed like maybe that counteracted it so that my overall success rate was about the same as what I normally get. But like I said, you learn something new every year. Now on to the highlights of some of the boas some of the specific boa litters that I had this year. And I wanted to start with some of the boas that I bred for the first time in 2022. And it's always particularly exciting to have a type of boa breed for you the first time. And so I showed you the Venezuelan true red tail uh, from Tamatama. I also had a type of dwarf boa born for me the first time, and that was my Cocker Key dwarf boas. And so this is one of the babies and I've been Really happy with these guys, they're just super cute. Really love the patterns and colors on these guys. And they're quite a bit different from the crawl key. You know, when I first got these boas, I didn't think they were that much different, but as I've kept them over the years, my appreciation for them has really uh, increased. And now I really can't decide if I like these or the cocker key better. Um, so these boas, these babies have been doing really, really well. They all fed no problem. They've been a joy to handle and interact with. Not at all hissy or defensive like my Terahimara and you know some of the other dwarf boas. And you know I actually kept some holdbacks because I'm planning on uh, increasing the size of my breeding group and really getting a nice group of these cocker keys going. I've already shipped out several of them. I still have a couple males remaining 
if you're interested. But just a really nice dwarf boa, the Cocker Key Dwarf Boa from Belize. I won't have any of these next year, but fingers crossed in 2024, I'll pair up my pair again, and hopefully they'll produce their second litter for me. Another first for 2022 was my first morph pairings. And as you know, I'm about 90, 95% locality boas, but I do have a small group of morph boas that I acquired more recently. Just been growing them up to get ready for breeding. I paired up two different pairs of morph boas. Unfortunately, one of them ended up slugging out, which was, you know, kind of a bummer. I got a litter from my Jungle Moran pairing. This was a Jungle Moran female crossed with a Jungle Moran male. And one of the real standouts was this animal. This is a Super Moran jungle. So this animal has two copies of the incomplete dominant Moran gene, which gives it this deep mar uh, maroon red color. She's also got the jungle gene, which gives her these aberrant looking saddles and kind of cleaner look overall and very high color saturation. So a real, real cool animal. You know, this animal I knew I had to keep for myself. Just such a cool animal. Uh, I think there's only been a handful of these Super Morans that have been produced, unfortunately. And although the Moran gene has been around quite a while, uh, you don't really see them very often, and I think it's definitely an underrated gene to, to work with. So I'm hoping to you know, produce more Moran boas going forward, combinations of Moran and Jungle and Hypo and you know, a few of the other more common genes. But this female has been really cool, really nice to work with, really docile. Um, I have some of her siblings, which are jungle morons, which are also really nice. I have a couple that I've shipped out. I have a couple still here. Um, so if you're interested in working with the moron gene, you should definitely check these out. Now I'm going to go over some pairings that worked for me and some that didn't. And one of the positives for this year was the dwarf boas. And as you know, dwarf boas are probably second only to the true red tails as far as their representation in my collection. And I like to have several different types of these paired up every year. So this year I produced, I showed you the Cocker Keys that I produced for the first time. I also produced uh, Qual Key and the Tar Humara Dwarf Boas. Those are my three favorite dwarf boas. Dwarf boa popularity has deservedly skyrocketed in the last few years. And I think probably the hottest dwarf boa right now are the Tar Humara dwarf boas. People just love these guys because they're the smallest locality boa. And in many ways, they look like a mini Argentine boa in terms of their coloration and their personality. And so I produced a small litter this year of the Tar Humara dwarf boas. They sold really quickly. There was a lot of demand for these animals. I actually held this one back, just one female to add to the breeding group grow up as a future breeder. And the rest are actually in their new home. So if you got one of these, I really appreciate your support and I hope the boa is doing really well. I hope to produce more of these next year and I'm still getting a lot of requests from people about interest in these tar and dwarf boas. I wish it was easier to breed them and I could just wave a magic wand and clone thousands of them so we could all get them. But unfortunately, that's not how boa breeding works. But uh, Tar Humara is a great boa to work with, and I hope to produce these again in 2023, as well as some of my other dwarf boas, so stay tuned for that. Another boa that worked out really well for me this year are my Suriname boas, and the Surinams are really the bread and butter of my collection, uh, the most numerous boa in the whole collection, and I've been breeding these every year for almost 10 years now. And so this is one of the babies from one of the four litters that I had. I actually paired up five different pairings and I got four litters, which is a pretty good result. One of the pairings, the female was gravid. Unfortunately, she delivered a bunch of slugs. And I believe this is the first time this has happened with the Suriname pairing. My Surinams, if they're gravid, I think they've always had a successful litter. So not exactly sure what happened. What makes it a little bit even more um, surprising is that this particular male that I paired her up with had two previous litters that successful in 2020 and 2021. So I don't know why 2022 just wasn't his year or he just didn't like this female. Uh, but for whatever reason, unfortunately, the female slugged out. But I three or four successful litters. Three of them are from my Prometheus bloodline. Um, I had one uh, pairing that was from an unrelated female 
who is on the small side and you know some people even expressed interest and asked me if maybe I can start a dwarf line of Suriname because this female is about four and a half or five feet long and she's about eight years old. And in fact, this is one of the babies that I think I'm gonna hold back. Just a really colorful example. I have so many Surinams that I've held back over the last few years. From the other three litters, they're all going to be uh, listed, you know, to go to their new homes. But I decided I wanted to hold back a pair from my dwarf boa. She's actually a female produced by Russell Lafleur that I've had in the collection for you know, almost 10 years now. And this is the first time I bred her. But just really, really nice animals, really lovely, colorful Surinams, beautiful patterns. Um, I'll, several of these have already been shipped out to their new homes from the first two litters. The third litter, which is the one from the uh, dwarfish, dwarfish, uh, Lafleur bloodline Suriname, these ones are almost ready to go. They're going to be listed very shortly on my Flickr site. And then I have one more litter. I needed to take the pictures to get those up, but those will probably be up in the next couple weeks. But if you're looking for a really nice, high quality Suriname boa, I've got quite a variety available. So check out the Flickr page and let me know if you have any questions on these. One more 2022 breeding that worked out really well, which is also a first time birth for me, are these Coops Pastel Colombian Boas. And I had actually tried breeding these the year before and I didn't have any luck. And then this year was my year. I got a nice litter of these beautiful, highly uh, colorful Colombian Boas. And um, that some of them like this one just literally look like they were dipped in orange paint. I mean, the, the color's just like exploding off of this animal. It almost doesn't look real. And so I hadn't been planning on holding any of these back, but I just can't resist. Some of these babies are just so colorful and just so saturated. I just really want to hold them back and then take the project to the next generation, make even more highly colorful pastel Colombian boas. So this project's already been going on for a number of generations. It was started by a guy named Coops in Europe. And then the project went to Vin, Vin Russo, who has been selectively breeding them. I got a pair that were produced by Vin Russo. And these babies, some of them look like they're even more colorful and saturated than their parents. So just want to take this to the next generation, maybe make the color go to the next level. And these animals, not only are they beautiful to look at, but they're really enjoyable to handle, uh, really mellow, great a pet boa. As I've said many times before, Colombian BCI are probably the best overall pet boa. So if you've been looking for a beautiful pet boa that you can take out and admire, the Coupes Pastel might be the boa for you. I still have a few of these uh, available, so they're up on the Flickr page. So go have a look if you're interested. Those were some of the litters that worked for me, but what are some of the litters that didn't work? So probably the biggest overall letdown for me this year were my Peruvian true red tails. And I actually did produce a few, a small litter of four babies. This is actually one of them that was born relatively recently. I had actually four pairings of Peruvians this year. And what ended up happening was three of them became gravid but then two of the three gravid females ended up delivering stillborns and slugs. And, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I had one litter that was just, you know, devastating uh, with about seven, there were seven stillborns and a number of slugs, just totally unexpected that I really haven't talked about very much because I kind of get choked up every time I think about it. But then I had another litter from a female who was actually proven, same pairing that I paired in 2020, and she also delivered a couple stillborns and some slugs. So I had this one litter from a first time pair, uh, four babies. There were also some stillborns. I, if I remember correctly, there were like three stillborns and some slugs. So Peruvians are just hard. So I, you know, I don't know if it's that it's some, there are conditions in my facility that somehow favor the Surinams to breed over the Peruvians, or maybe the Surinams I have are just more well adapted to breeding in captivity. You know, for whatever reason, you know, or combination. Um, but I just think sir, Peruvians are hard. You know, I think that if you look at other people, what they're getting as far as successful litters and what's for sale, you don't see a lot of successful Peruvian litters. You see a lot more Suriname and Guiana. Um, 
also the price of Peruvians has just skyrocketed in the last few years there's just none available so I think this is partially due to the fact that they're just hard to breed and you know red tails in general true red tails are hard to breed but it seems like the Peruvians for whatever reason are just hard to breed consistently and you know do it well year after year so that being said I did get the small litter of four um, I'm you know kind of holding on to them for now I'll probably keep at least two of them probably have some available at some point I'm not in any hurry to ship these guys out you know just want to enjoy them for a little while uh, they're actually they were huge when they were born you can see this female even though she's only about a little over a month old you can see she's pretty big and you know they were like as thick around as my thumb when they were born so definitely much bigger than my dwarf boas I'll be repeating some of my Peruvian pairings in 2023 I have a couple females who are ready to go into breeding and you know hopefully I'll have better luck this year um, not exactly sure what I can do differently you know keeping the animals together obviously is a good thing I might use more multiple males you know two males with a female to try to increase the odds of success but we'll just have to see I'm hoping for Peruvians in 2023 I know so many people want them but I didn't get any Peruvians in 2021 and in 2020 I had a litter of I believe six so it's just you know difficult and uh, to produce these guys and you don't get big litters and they're just really hard to come by so I just got to appreciate the small litters that I can get you know when I get them but they certainly are beautiful animals and really the crown jewel of any locality boa collection there were a few types of boas that I paired in 2022 that I had already failed at in the previous year or the year before and these are types which I still have not bred successfully and I actually did a video on this where I go into the details titled I failed at breeding these boas so check that one out if you haven't seen it already but um, you know the three main types are the North Brazilian BCC the um, Amarali, the Bolivian short tail boa and then this one this is a Paraguana Peninsula boa from Venezuela and for these guys actually this is a wild type normal coloration I had a pairing of the wild types and I also had a pairing of my anorithristic Paraguana Peninsula boas and neither of them got gravid so not quite sure what happened with these guys I think there's definitely luck involved with being successful in some boa breeding projects and in some cases all I can do is try again the following year so with these Paraguana Peninsula boas what I plan to do is to use both of my males on my one anorithristic female for next year maybe that'll help increase my odds of success um, but you know no guarantees of success and you know some projects are just not going to work that's just part of breeding boas but we'll have to see we'll give it a go and see how it works in 2023 and hopefully of those three types of boas at least one of them will be successful next year the last thing I wanted to say in this video is about my plans for the 2023 boa breeding year and it's actually only about a month away I'll be pairing up boas probably in uh, early to mid November so about a month away and I don't have my final uh, roster finalized yet I have in my head a pretty good idea about which ones I'm going to be pairing I have to get it down on paper think about the final selections and which ones are going to go into breeding trials I should have about the same number of pairings th next year as I had this year maybe a little bit less but hopefully we'll have a higher rate of success so the number of babies will be about the same and I'll have all my usual locality boas lots of different red tails Peruvians Surinams Venezuelans etc I'll have a lot of the dwarf boas including the crawl key boa this is a five-year-old female born here in 2017 and she's ready to go into breeding trials for the first time just really like this one she's got this really light coloration a lot of like purpley pink lilac colors on her side really nice example of a dwarf locality boa I'll have a couple morph pairings different from my morph pairings that I had this year and uh, it should be a pretty good season keep me busy hopefully produce some top-notch examples of boas so stay tuned to this channel where I give regular updates on my breeding progress and litters that are coming down the pipeline as well as a look at the baby boas when they're born uh, for the first time 
I expect hopefully the boa should start being born in the spring and then be born through the summer into the fall. Uh, it should be a pretty good year ahead. So I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you have any questions or comments about my boas or boa breeding or boas in general, please don't hesitate to reach out or write them in the comments below. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas and best of luck with your breeding projects in the year ahead.